Hi, this is Krusty Bob, and today I have a strange little mystery item that I picked up at a garage sale. As you can see, it's not very big, about an inch and a half thick, and three and five eighths inches wide, and weighs about ten ounces. There are two pieces connected by what looks like parachute cord, and inside one of the pieces is what looks like parachute cloth. My first thought was that this might be from a parachute flare, although these metal pieces seem awfully heavy for something like a flare. However, when I did a lot of googling to find out what this might be, I came upon a surplus dealer who had these for sale and called them Flare slash Bomb Parachute. They also called them Small Parachute for 10 pound bomb, new old stock, packed in 1954. The 10 pound bomb reference proved to be a key point for trying to figure out exactly what this was, for a flare or a bomb. Turns out it is, in fact, for a bomb, a 10 pound cluster bomb, its full name being bomb, comma, non-persistent gas, comma, GB, comma, 10 pounds, comma, E54R6. It later became the M125 bomblet. Okay, that's a scary thing, a gas bomb. We'll get back to this cluster bomb thing in a moment, but first let's revisit the parachute. The parachute mechanism has its own nomenclature, mil-p-13342, comma, parachute, comma, 10 pound bomb, E4R1, 25 March 1954, etc., etc., so on and so forth. The official description of this is, This is a 14-inch diameter semi-hemispherical chute made of nylon or rayon with nylon shroud lines connected to the end of the bomb and covered by a special retaining cap, that being this thing. One Air Force report I found said that there were 23,700 cluster bombs assembled from components originally stockpiled for about 63,000 cluster bombs. So that means they had a lot more of these parachutes and other parts than they actually needed. They had two types of parachutes, for the Type A body and for the Type B body. They had 309,000 of the Type A and over 2.5 million of the Type B in storage. Besides the one I have here, the only other ones of these I found online were at Omaha's Surplus website. Seems like they had at least a case of these. That means maybe many thousands are still sitting in a warehouse or got melted down. Government specifications say the M125 bomb is 3 and 5 eighths inches in diameter and 12 inches long, vacuum filled through a rubber diaphragm at the rear, which is sealed with solder, and equipped with a parachute that is secured and packed under a cover at the tail of the bomb. Here's a government drawing of this bomblet, as they call it, and you can see where the parachute unit attaches to it. The bomblet weighs about 8.5 pounds and includes 2.6 pounds of poison GB gas, also known as sarin, which was developed by the Nazis in World War II. These cluster bombs were designed for nasty purposes. They were developed by the Air Force and Army circa 1950 because they thought they needed some new gas bombs, even though I believe poison gas was pretty much not used against ground troops in World War II, and maybe had not been used since World War I, many decades before this particular type of bomb was being developed. Many accounts say Adolf Hitler was afraid to use gas against enemy troops for fear of retaliation. He was gassed in World War I and was temporarily blinded. But the real reason the Nazis did not use it in ground combat may have to do with Horses. The Nazis depended greatly on horses. In fact, they used over 2.75 million horses and mules in World War II to tow their supplies and artillery, especially during the invasion of the Soviet Union. Apparently, the problem was nobody had invented a satisfactory gas mask for the horses. If a retaliatory gas attack killed the horses, the German army may have been stranded and literally stuck in the Soviet mud. 76 of these little M125 bombs were loaded into a bigger bomb for a 1,000-pound capacity. This was the E101R3 M34 cluster bomb. Wikipedia says the M34 cluster bomb was the first mass-produced United States Army weapon meant to deliver GB, the military designation for sarin. By 1973, they started destroying these deadly bombs. I don't know if they destroyed them because they realized how inhumane gas warfare is, or if they were just concerned because the bombs were a couple of decades old and might start rusting and corroding and leaking. Now here's a description of the process used to disassemble and neutralize the small gas bombs. I'll leave this up on the screen for a few seconds, so if you want you can hit the YouTube pause button and read a little bit about the process. Otherwise, we'll get back to the parachute. By the way, these parachute parts are perfectly safe and were never anywhere near gas or anything else hazardous. These were punched out in some steel mill and then packaged in a shipping case like this one, 
shown on the website for Omaha's Surplus, which has some of these for sale at pretty low prices, I'll say. As we learned, the parachute is mounted to the tail of the bomb, and if you look at the photos, you can see a six inch long metal tube which contains ignition components and is hooked to the bomb body by a 30 inch long wire rope to retain the parachute mechanism under 60 to 70 pounds pressure using a crimp steel tubing. When the bomb is released from the cluster, a spring-driven mild steel arming bar releases a lock pin, which allows a spring-driven pin to fire the M26 primer. This in turn burns through the first fire mixture, the delay mixture, and black powder, exploding ignition powder, and breaking the end of the body, thereby releasing the wire and the cover over the parachute. I have not pulled this parachute out of the cover, so I guess it's time to see what happens when I do. <laughs> we have a little uh, parachute cake right there. Rusty Bob, over and out.